it's Chris here with Love to Dev, and today I wanted to post a video. It's actually an old video uh, from a presentation I did it at O'Reilly's Velocity Conference in Santa Clara, California, back in May of 2015. And the title of this presentation is uh, I don't know, crap. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. That's, that was really awesome to have you introduce me uh, and to be up here at Velocity and, and to share uh, a talk about two things that I'm truly passionate about, and that's single page web applications and making really fast web experiences. So hopefully this morning uh, I'll be able to share some knowledge based on experience uh, over the last five, maybe six years really, uh, and how I apply that to building uh, really good user experiences. And that's ultimately what I try to do is, is take the user and put them first, and something I call user-first development. And I think that's something that a lot of developers struggle with because we, we tend to think of development from our perspective, and I call it developer-driven development or developer-first development. And I think some of the approaches I've had to learn to do uh, kind of go against that grain, and so hopefully it'll make sense to you as we go through this, and it'll be educational. So like Steve said, my blog is Love to Dev, and I'm, um, I go through phases. Where, I, where I'll post a lot and then I'll come back. But right now I'm kind of in a phase where I'm posting a lot. So uh, a lot of good stuff in the works. Um, I'm on Twitter quite a bit too, and I share a lot of stuff about web performance optimization and just web development in general. And you can follow me at Chris Love. And if this will go. There we go. All right. So uh, who am I? Um, I always try to share a little background information on me. I've been doing web development literally since 1992, back when I was uh, in college, and we, had all, we were on the, uh, the fiber there, and, and we were starting to publish uh, articles and stuff. And I, and I say that because it actually is kind of interesting because with single page applications, we've kind of gone back and leveraged a feature that we used back then, primarily the hash fragment, to drive the application. And I think it's kind of interesting how it's kind of come full circle from something back then where we used to just publish these big, long articles with table of contents at the top uh, to something where we're driving this really rich experience off the same exact uh, mechanism. Um, so for the last eight years or so, I've been an ASP.NET MVP and also an ASP Insider. That means I get to do, interact a lot with the team up at Microsoft that builds and manages the ASP.NET uh, stack for them. And it's been a very interesting experience and, and really driven me professionally. And then a few years ago, um, I actually went to an Internet Explorer session at the summit up there looking to pick a fight uh, and wound up being asked to be part of a, a program called the User Agents, which has been fascinating because that gives me a lot of direct access to the Internet Explorer team who is also proxied and introduced me to guys on Chrome and Firefox. But more importantly, it's given me a lot of insight into how browsers work and how they go about writing uh, and organizing and architecting the browsers, which in turn allows me to understand better how uh, to architect my stuff so I can leverage the browser infrastructure uh, to make things go a little better. And like Steve said, um, I've written a few books. Uh, like I said, the last one is the single page app book, which um, is still uh, available. Uh, it's only $10, uh, and it's about a year and a half old. And there's some things that I did back then that I've kind of refactored that will probably come out a little bit in this talk. Uh, you can think about it, so anything that's 18 months old in, in our world is, tends to get stale. Um, but a lot of the core concepts are still valid, and I still leverage them quite a bit, and you're gonna see those come out as we walk through the application. Now, the unfortunate thing is that I built the demo application and I wrote the book, and it's a demo that I've been using probably for four years and refactoring along the way. Um, and it's been based on the Rotten Tomatoes API, so it's like a movie application, sort of like a Fandango or, or something like that. Unfortunately, about six weeks ago, I realized that the Rotten Tomatoes API is more or less becoming deprecated, which means my application doesn't really work. And that's forced me to have to build a brand new demo. Um, it's, uh, let's just say it's still kind of baking. Um, there are probably going to be some, some demons that we're going to walk across here a little bit, but for the most part, it's, it's coming together nicely. Um, I had a question already posted on the, uh, the session on the uh, site about where's the repo. Well, I, I finally got the repo uh, officially public this morning, um, and as well as the slide deck. The slide deck I'm going through is, is also available as well. Um, I, put, I put everything up on SlideShare. My repo is up on GitHub, and I'll also send the, the slide deck to the, uh, or, the organizers of Velocity so they can make it part of that as well. 
So this, this is the one slide you want to get so they can get the slide deck and go get the code. So if you want to take pictures, go ahead. Um, I'll wait. Um, there's also, there are about, I think there's like 30 slide decks up on SlideShare, and I've got, I don't know, three or four dozen uh, repos. And a lot of the repos that are up there are little modules and libraries that I'm going to use in this application uh, to drive this experience. In particular, I have a SPAL uh, JS library, and that kind of drives uh, the, the single page application experience. And I've also added uh, a view engine concept to it. Um, there's a little caching library and some, some other little things that I've, I've built out of necessity over the years to kind of drive this experience. Um, the movie repo is up there as well. So you can go kind of poke around my repos and kind of get an idea of some things I've been working on. So single page apps and everything. By the way, who, who's actually written or tried to write a single page web application? Okay, that's, that's a pretty good number of you out there. Good. Well, so I've kind of gone on this journey over, the, like I said, the last six or so years, maybe even more. They all kind of run together. But if you go back to when Steve produced the High Performance uh, Websites book back in 2007, um, there was, I was kind of going through this phase right there where uh, I was kind of starting to lose projects to some other shops that were primarily PHP and not .NET. And obviously, I've been a .NET guy for a long time. Um, it was kind of curious to me because uh, I had to figure out what was going on. And, and what it really boiled down to is they had learned how to use jQuery at the time. And so I started kind of learning this jQuery thing. And somewhere in there, I started using the jQuery UI dialog. And if you've done any web development over the last decade or so, you've probably used something like the jQuery UI dialog or some other modal dialog concept. And it, got, it kind of got me thinking, right? Hmm. All we're doing is just showing and hiding stuff on a page. And so we look at code, and it looked sort of like this. This is actually something I think I ripped off their uh, demo site. Um, but you'll notice that all this is, is is just a regular div. And usually we place those somewhere down at the bottom of the page. And we would, through CSS styling somehow or another, set it to display none. And it'd just be hidden. It'd just be sitting down there in the DOM. And then when it came time to render that dialog over the content that we were using, we would, it would just implement this display block part right there. And that would be the only thing that would change. And then that modal dialog would display, and we would interact with the dialog. We'd hit OK or cancel or whatever it was to submit or, or, or dismiss that dialog. And it would just change the, the, the display setting back to none. And of course, process you know, any kind of posting or whatever we needed to do. So if you're like me, Maybe your wheels started churning at the time. And I was working on, I wouldn't say it was necessarily a large application, but it was kind of a complex uh, application. It was a data entry line of business application. If you're in the enterprise, that's, that's the majority of what you wind up doing is, is forms over data kind of stuff. But it, was, it had a lot of pieces to it. And there was actually a lot of dialogues in this application. So it was a really fertile application to kind of drive my mindset on this. So I started kind of toying with how can I leverage this high performance or web performance optimization uh, world with this concept I've got in my head, because I didn't know what to call it at the time. You've got to think about it. This is like 2009, 2010 time frame that this is, this is going on in my head. And so I started kind of playing with, what if I put all the pages into a single page? Yeah, see where this is going. And, and I started showing and hiding these things. And I went through a lot of gyrations trying to figure out how to do this. And, uh, it was kind of one of my little side projects that I'd do at night and stuff like that. So, uh, but after I finished that, we wrapped up that project. Um, you know, a couple more kind of came through. And then the owners of the company decided to peel a few of us off and build a, a product that we were going to uh, sell. And this was, this was a, a, an opportunity I, that my initial plan was not to do what we call a spa today. But it, it really kind of forced my hand to go down this path. And we started in mid-May, and uh, by the end of the summer, we, we launched the application with 400 views in it. So we went from nothing to 400 views. And when I say a view, that directly correlates to a classic page. Um, and I try to use views to really indicate a spa because um, it's a, a different kind of beast of an application. Um, another, another requirement of this application, it had to be modular and it had to be extensible. One of our plans with this product was to be able to build 
kind of sub applications inside of this. It really was more of a platform to launch applications with them. And we wanted to make it something that we could extend and offer and just keep adding more to it and then open up like a marketplace um, so that third parties or, or customers themselves could write custom modules to this. So there was a lot of pieces to have to manage and think about what is this going to look like in a year or two kind of concept. And uh, of course we had to do it in four months. And here was the biggest thing. I had nothing to reference at the time. There really wasn't any like, this is a spa library. This is a good mobile first library. Oh, that's the other thing too. We had to make it work first on the phone and then tablets and desktop as well. And it had to be a good experience across all of those. So I had all these, these challenges. And of course at the time everybody's like, oh, native applications. But I kind of realized the native application was not going to be something we were going to be able to launch cost effectively. And somebody was talking to me a little bit ahead of time, you know, when do you use native, when do you use web? And, and I say 99% of the time, just, just go ahead with, go with web. Um, because more or less, you're not going to need some of the native features. Uh, but you can also make web experiences that are just as good, if not better, than what we see out of native applications. And, and I know that because I've built a lot of experiences like that. And a lot of times I'll actually look at native applications and I'll try to apply them to the web and I can usually make it go faster. And I, I do look at native applications because they've got a lot of good UI stuff. All right, so I learned a lot of lessons in this process. Um, one, with 400 views and you're trying to load it over a cellular connection on the phone, it doesn't work very well. Um, you think about all the markup and all the JavaScript and all the CSS that's involved in support, you know, right out of the bat, having 400 views available, it doesn't go very well. And it, it was about two weeks before we were officially going to launch, and I was, uh, I was at a Phillies game, and uh, this lady sitting next to me, was, we were talking kind of before the game, and it turned out she was a target customer for this particular product. I mean, we, I was telling her about it, and she was getting all excited. She's like, that will make my job a whole lot easier. And I was like, woo. And she goes, can I see it? And I was like, OK, let me pull up my phone. All right, so this is like 2010, I think. Anyway, um, I'm on Sprint 3G. Who has Sprint 3G or has suffered through Sprint 3G? I, I had like the worst cellular carrier in the world. Um, slow, I mean just really dog slow. 3G is more like edge at best, okay, on Sprint. And I know that because I've seen like analysis and like PC Magazine and stuff like that just showing how much slower Sprint was on AT&T and Verizon and, and T-Mobile at the time. So I whip out my little phone and um, try to connect to it and you know, I'm in a ballpark with about 35 to 40,000 other people and you know, just like we're here today, you know, my phone's on 4G in here today, the one the last I checked, and it was a little sluggish. Um, didn't go very well. She was not very impressed, and I don't blame her. It took about a minute to get the login page up, which was our initial page to, uh, to go into. Um, didn't, didn't go over well. And I knew there was a lot of stuff that I, need, I still needed to work on. That was just one of those things that kind of emphasized the work that I needed to do to make this thing go faster and have a better experience. So I had to, I've, I, over the years, I've tried to figure out how not to load everything at once. Not only is it just the loading, but also when you have a lot of, say, DOM elements in the browser, they get more sluggish. Um, just because there's so much more they have to process. Um, so one of, the, one of the goals you've got to have is try to keep your DOM as lean as possible. And uh, not only is that a, a load time performance enhancer, but it's also a runtime performance enhancer. And like I just kind of with that story, mobile really matters. And this is something I see even today, most developers, especially in the enterprise, don't consider this. And I think this is a, a big mistake. Um, a lot of enterprise IT decision makers, development leads that I, that I talk to, uh, don't seem to think that mobile is happening in their company. And another story I like to tell about that, uh, I was at a, a company and, and I was in a meeting with a development lead, and she had 1,500 developers that worked underneath her between uh, the U.S. And, and India. And we're sitting in an office, and it's one of those offices that had a glass wall, so you could see the cube farm out there, and it was, you know, all her developers that were there, you know, probably about 50 of them right there immediately with us. And she was telling me that, that their company doesn't do mobile. 
but yet I'm looking at the cubes, and they have like short walls, so I can really see a lot of this stuff. I was looking at tablets on almost everybody's desk, everybody had a cell phone, and I was looking around at the conference room. She was the only one in the conference room that didn't have a tablet she was checking email and taking notes on. Um, so for her to say that mobile didn't matter in their company, even with her developers, I think that was wrong. And when I talked to the actual business folks, they all like to use mobile. And if you're like me and you, you, you get to travel a lot, um, you look around at the airport and you see a lot of uh, iPads and, and Franken pads turned into, you know, trying to be laptops or, or like a surface. And I've talked to some of these people and they're like, oh yeah, I've got my corporate issued laptop sitting in my suitcase over there, but it's a big honking beast. I don't like it. And I like this device much better. So we just know how to get on the network without the IT guys knowing how to do it. So people are getting around it and they're doing mobile whether you like it or not. And that's another advantage that being on the web gives you is you don't have to worry about the device the person uses. You should be able to meet them at their, at their choice and give them a reasonably good experience. The other side of it is you've got to understand that at least 25% of the time people are on cellular connections. And if you look at the stats like for e-commerce and stuff, we're, we're getting past the 50-50 threshold where people are more and more on mobile class devices. And you've got to consider and assume that they're on some sort of cellular connection. And like I said, test over Sprint 3G or some facsimile thereof. Um, you know, this is, this is actually a great experience here because if, if, I was sitting over there, all of a sudden the network got dog slow. It was a great test experience as I was kind of walking through making sure the application works right. And I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is really bad. Either that or, or go to a hotel. Um, several times last night the hotel Wi-Fi went completely down on me. Or take a flight and try to connect to the in-flight Wi-Fi and see what the experience is that way. If you're like me and you fly southwest, they all have in-flight Wi-Fi. The problem is they, half the airplane is sitting there streaming TV through the, the free dish network offering. So yeah, there's not a lot of bandwidth on the flight. Um, so that's also another good test to see if your application is uh, structured well. So like I said, back at, the, back at the, the, that time, I had no clue what I was really doing. I didn't know to, what, what to call it necessarily. I just started calling it a modern web application. Well, other people who seem to have more influence than I do uh, started calling it a single page application and I kind of like it. Plus we get to use the term spa and I can find these really groovy pictures to theme behind everything. So uh, we'll call it a single page application and uh, we'll go from there, right? So there's a lot of pieces to what a single page application is and there's some concepts that I think developers need to kind of gro grok and, and just get a hold of. And some of that is, is what exactly is a spa? Well, like I said, it's composed of all the views, the views, which traditionally would be individual pages. But instead of making those individual requests to get each individual page rendered on the server, we've got to kind of move some of that con some of those, those the mechanics up to the browser now. And we've got to understand that our spa has all the views or all the pages to compose our application available in the in the client now. Or like I was talking to Steve ahead of time, um, when I go into these enterprises, the spa thing is, is really new and they're, they're still kind of intimidated by the, the concept. And so what I usually tell them to do is kind of go down the, you know, do like a spa, pick a few pages that are related, compose those together, get your head wrapped around what the experience is like. So I call that a spa -let, and I think that's a good transition, sort of like when I was talking about the jQuery UI thing. That's effectively what I did. I went from a dialog to like some spa -let concepts and then up. And in fact, when we built that big application back in 2010, that's more or less what I had to do. I had to kind of group some of those modules into a single spa before I could get my head wrapped around how to make a big full application spa. And along with all the views, you've got all the styles, and of course you've got all the JavaScript. So you've got a lot of things that are, that are running in the browser that wouldn't necessarily be there or necessarily have to be there. And of course the spa mechanically, you're gonna leverage Ajax or maybe even sockets. Uh, if, you're, if you're really fancy, uh, to, to make those calls back and forth to the server to get data or any other assets and resources you may need. And I think if you're doing it right, you're going to be leveraging storage. And you're going to see, I use local storage quite ex uh, exhaustively or, or a lot, for a lot of uh, reasons. And I was, I was very excited when I was, was watching Patrick's talk before because a lot of those things are really going to help in, in this aspect of, of what I consider a good spa. And of course, like I mentioned before, you, you, you want to leverage the hash fragment 
uh, to drive uh, the deep linking kind of experience into your application. Um, there's, there's a couple of advantages to that. It, it does trigger an event that your, that your framework can pick up on and drive what I call view swapping, but it also gives you that deep link experience so that you can give somebody a link directly to, the to that particular content and it will hydrate itself uh, based on that link. And that way you get around a problem that was kind of problematic, especially with like Flash and Silverlight with the rich applications kind of getting deep linking. There was a lot of kind of hacks that like that both of them did to kind of drive that experience. And some of it was based on this hash fragment thing. Now another thing I learned the hard way, talking about the, the phones, is mobile browsers. And these really kind of pushed me to make a lot of decisions at the time, and they still do. And I always make these be uh, my limiting reagent, uh, kind of determining how far I can push stuff. And something I learned uh, really quickly is that the mobile browsers tend to aggressively purge browser cache. In fact, when I was working on that application, I learned real quickly that the iPhone, does not, at the time, did not cache anything that was over 26 kilobytes in size. And I think Steve even had a, a blog post or, or two about that and some tests online to kind of to, to test that. And, uh, and so that was a real big problem. So back then, I was using jQuery to build all my applications from. And jQuery completely gzipped and minified was somewhere around 30 to 32 kilobytes. It was, it was too large. So every single page request back and forth to the server meant that it was going to reload jQuery along the way. It also meant any images that were more than 26 kilobytes were also going to get pulled back across the wire every single time. And that was not a good experience. And that was causing a lot of problems in my early spa endeavors with customers and, and myself. And it was really frustrating. So I had to learn to adapt, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Another reason why the browsers um, purge a little more often is because they've got uh, smaller memory available to them, and they've also got weaker processes, right? So not only is it in you know, memory, but the storage and the processors just aren't as strong. So to compensate for that, they, they tend to jettison stuff when they determine that it may not necessarily be needed anymore. And you don't really have control over it, uh, even on desktop, you don't have control. But desktop essentially has an infinite uh, storage bin for it, so it doesn't purge it quite as often. Um, so the mobile browsers really kind of forced me to, to kind of make some decisions. Uh, the next thing was, like I said, the cellular connections. They're obviously slower than broadband. And I think this is, I think this is a common problem that most developers uh, the, have. Uh, I think we need to make some sort of effort to get developers to understand that they need to test their application beyond local host. Because local host, you don't have the network latencies, and you definitely don't have cellular uh, latencies. I love the fact that the, the Chrome developer team has added uh, like the cellular emulator in the developer tools where you can kind of spoof different uh, uh, bandwidth types like you know, 3G and, and stuff like that to give you a reasonable idea what this, might, this experience might be like on, on a phone or a cellular connection. But nothing beats having a real cellular connection. So, you know, like I said, hotels and airplanes, nothing else, Teth tether off your phone if you, if you can do that. I actually do that from time to time just to see what the experience is gonna be like. Unfortunately, AT&T seems to be getting really fast lately and it's not giving me as good of a, of a test, so to speak. Um, Another thing is cellular connections are, are kind of unreliable. Like I said, I was sitting over there in the first session and my, my connection was dropped down to like two bars on 4G um, in, in my house. Uh, it's essentially a dead zone in some places. We have to stick the phones in the windows half the time or if you drive through tunnels or if you go to my kid's school, their school building seems to be a Faraday cage. It doesn't let cellular signals in. Um, or maybe that's just my uh, teenager not wanting to text me back. I don't know. So. But uh, always assume that connection is unreliable, which is why the whole concept of offline is, is big. And I don't see enough people working uh, towards doing offline stuff. And, and here's a big one. And I love that Tim Cadlick uh, created the site, what, what does my site cost.com, because I had been thinking about doing the same thing, but he beat me to the punch, which saved me some time. But if you really want to know what it costs somebody to download your site, uh, run it through web page test or just take it straight to, well, what does my site cost.com. He gives you roughly what it's going to cost for somebody to download your site, assuming that they're on 
uh, published expensive data plans in different countries. And uh, lo and behold, Vanuatu, for some reason, is extremely expensive. Um, but uh, anyway, I always encourage you to do that. Now, that's a big deal because when you go look at how much bandwidth uh, each page or your application actually requires to, to work, um, and then put a dollar on that, you know, it should not cost the user more to download your page than it costs to buy your product. Always keep that in mind, okay? And I think a lot of pages don't. And this is one of my favorite pictures now. Um, I think it's Jason Grigsby uh, coined the term uh, somewhere in the last couple of years. We've created the web in our own image and it's obese. And that's, that's definitely true. Now, um, you know, I go around talking about web performance optimization all the time and I, and I was feeling kind of like a hypocrite in a way. Um, so I went to the doctor mid-December and I weighed in and I was about 30 pounds more than I expected to be. And I was like, I gotta do something about this. So I set out this year to lose, uh, to lose weight to get back to where I was in college. And, and so since the beginning of the year, I've lost 70 pounds. And I can tell you flat out, I feel a lot better. I actually feel a lot like I did in college. And I think we've gotta do the same kind of, put the same kind of effort and energy into our websites. So if you go to httparchive.org, Steve publishes stats twice a month, and I think these are the beginning of May's stats right here. And there's some really sad numbers here. Um, the average site has 99 requests, and it's composed of over two megs of content. And to me, that's, that's a really bad sign. Um, so I'll put it this way. Uh, back in 96, I wrote a graduate thesis, it's 186 pages. I could fit that, I think, uh, four times on a three and a half inch floppy disk. The average web page, at least the, the home pages here, would not even fit on that floppy disk anymore. And that's, that's to me, that's a really sad state of where we've gotten with the web. And if you look at some of the other numbers, it's 18 JavaScript files, 318 kilobytes, and, and on down. Um, it's just not a good sign. Um, of course, out of that two megs, 1.3 is images, and I will talk a little bit about images as we go through this. Um, the thing about it, I, and Steve can correct me, from looking at the data that he, he runs through there is really home pages. But as I go through and I kind of analyze, you know, deep, deeper linked pages and sites, um, I see a lot bigger numbers. To me, these are really conservative. Um, so a lot of times I'll, I'll go and, and analyze like you know, inside pages, if you will, of, of, of sites and applications. And I see five, six, 10, 15 megabytes. If you go to any newspaper site, and punch in a URL from the newspaper, you'll be appalled at what you see. He was talking about a thousand requests. I think a typical newspaper site is about a thousand requests. Um, 318 kilobytes of JavaScript. And I think a lot of that is a third party, especially uh, adware uh, uh, propagating around the web. But you know, I see, I'm seeing more and more problems as I'm going into the enterprise. I actually um, left a project about six weeks ago and they had over 550 kilobytes of JavaScript already, and they just had two partially working pages. And I felt that was a big travesty, and they didn't like the fact that I was kind of pointing out the, the, the problem with that. But I'm seeing more and more sites that have over a meg, or even close, getting close to two megs of JavaScript in some cases. And they're just layering on framework after framework, because this one had this little small feature, and this one had this little small feature. And it's really causing a lot of problems with sites loading, or, or just rendering, you know. And, and so we've got to figure out a way to fix that. And if you get into single page applications, the potential for a lot of JavaScript and CSS is high. And so we've got to kind of understand how to keep this to a minimum without making it too truly difficult for developers. So I've come up with this thing. I'm gonna call them fast food frameworks. And a lot of us are familiar with these guys. There are a lot of the big libraries and frameworks that we've come really uh, happy using. Now the problem is they're all big and some of them are bigger than others. Um, and most of them are not modular. And the other thing I've found too is uh, I, I can track memory leaks in a lot of them. And if you're building a single page application, your application is very sensitive to memory leaks because somebody should, if, especially in a line of business, I have a rule. I want the person to be able to get to work, log into their computer at nine o'clock on Monday morning and not have to hit refresh if possible on that application until they go home Friday afternoon when they turn their computer off. Now if I've got memory leaks in my application, even small ones, those are just gonna gradually build up until the browser can't move anymore and it's just gonna crash. For example, I can spend about 10 minutes on my iPad on Facebook and crash mobile Safari. 
And that's because there's, I've tracked a ton of memory leaks in React. And so whenever I consider a framework or a library or something that I'm working on, I always try to do memory profiling in there too and make sure I get that stuff cleaned up. But you know, like I said, they're very large. They're not necessarily modular. Bootstrap is kind of the exception to that modular uh, statement. Of course, it's a CSS uh, uh, library. And it's got some jQuery components to it as well. I don't use those. Um, but Bootstrap is actually modular if you know how to, to create a, a less file to compile it the way you need it to be compiled. And then, of course, we've got some other advantages I'll show you here in a little bit, too. So something I had to learn the hard way is I had to get rid of jQuery. Now, it was very painful because I loved jQuery. jQuery was my best buddy. Um, I, told, uh, I told somebody, you know, jQuery is really the Iron Man suit of web development, you know, or the DOM elements, if you will. And it just, it just opened up a whole new world for all of us. But like I said, jQuery was big, and it was causing my applications to load slowly. And as well, they, were, they weren't necessarily running as fast. And that's because they've got a lot of cruft in there. It's not that jQuery is bad. The design of jQuery is fantastic. The, but because it was trying to fix a lot of you know, issues with especially legacy browsers um, and the variations, say, on Android of browsers, it, it got really big. And I've, I've kind of actually noticed they've, they've been able to trim about 10 or 15% over the last six months, which is very admirable. But I had to kind of learn to, to dump jQuery for a lot of reasons. Um, so uh, it gave me faster load times when I dumped that excess weight. Um, but it forced me to have to master the DOM or the browser APIs. And at first, that, that felt like a really intimidating thing. But I, I've kind of grown to learn there's only about three dozen API calls that I really need to be intimately familiar with. The rest of them, I can learn as I need to. Uh, I don't necessarily need to use them all the time, but like a pen child and, and stuff like that, I use all the time. Um, and I also learned that there are some alternatives out there. The first one I looked at was Zepto. But Zepto was really not good about backward compatibility at all. So I had to kind of, eh, I don't know. And there's a, there was a few others. I think uh, Filament Group may have one and, uh, and everything. And then one day, I just one Saturday afternoon, I just created one called Dollar Bill. And uh, I, think, I think minimized, I think it's like eight kilobytes. And it has all the functionality that I needed from jQuery without the Ajax stack in it. And honestly, Ajax was the last reason I was holding on to jQuery in my applications. And I kind of looked at it, and I found, a, I found a couple of libraries, one in particular I liked called Request. It's spelled R-E-Q-W-E-S-T. And it implemented the jQuery API, but as a standalone Ajax call. And even now, I've actually purged that one out and just replaced it with a few lines of code that does my Ajax for me, and I've abstracted it just a little bit. Um, so I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm losing weight left and right. It, this has also taught me to be a lot more modular so one of the big knocks I have against big frameworks is that they aren't modular. I can't just plug and replace pieces of the, mod, the framework that I don't necessarily like, and I can't just pull out the small piece that I do like. Remember, I've been to different shops, and they'll have, they'll have jQuery with Backbone on top of it, with Ember involved, and Angular, and also React, uh, because there's one little piece of each one that they like. And for the life of me, I don't know why. And I see, I've actually seen blog posts come out this year how to use Angular with React, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so, um, but it's taught me to be a lot more modular, make everything kind of plug pluggable. And the other thing too, um, the 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 fire hose that we we kind of drink from goes really fast, and we're constantly refactoring, coming up with new concepts. So, like I was saying, I just use that AJAX example for a minute. So I replaced jQuery's AJAX stack with Request. And then I replaced it with, a, with a, about 20 lines of code, to be honest with you, for the core stuff. Um, but I was able to quickly swap those out in some of my applications because I'd made them very modular and, and pluggable. And that's a very key thing because you can keep something that, that you haven't really had time to fix, but you've made another piece better. And you can kind of gradually improve stuff. And yeah, it was painful for a little bit. And I thought it was going to be a lot worse than it was, but in the end, uh, it actually was a pretty great experience, kind of getting rid of that. But to do that, I did, I did do a lot of reverse engineering of jQuery. Paul Irish has, has some great videos on things he learned by studying the jQuery source code. And if you haven't really dug deep into JavaScript, go watch those videos. It's, it's, it's a great kind of intermediate advanced thing, but in a, in a very approachable way. So um, uh, my railing against these fast food frameworks, they're full of fat. So there's a lot of pieces in these frameworks you'll never use but you still have to download. The browser has to evaluate 
those things. So uh, not only is it bandwidth time, the browser still have to go through and evaluate. And for a desktop, it's not really that big of a deal. But again, when you get on the cell phones and the tablets and stuff like that, it, it starts becoming a bigger and bigger deal. And when you've got 20 or 30 JavaScript files that have to get evaluated, and they're all a lot of clumpy JavaScript and stuff like that, it's not that inconceivable to have a whole second delay waiting for the JavaScript just to be evaluated once it's downloaded. And there's a lot of syntactic sugar. This is a problem that I also see uh, with developers. They're, they're not trying to understand the browser API. They're not actually trying to understand CSS or JavaScript. And there was a, like I said, I, I use local storage quite extensively. And uh, I was trying to show a developer on a team that I was working with last summer um, how to use local storage. And he freaked out because he saw this, wor this, wor this word, local storage. And he goes, where is that in the Angular library? And I said, it's not part of Angular, it's part of the browser. He goes, oh, well, you can't use it then unless Angular does it. And I've kind of run across that mentality a lot. And I think that's sad because uh, it's keeping developers from actually learning the platform that they're working on. And you've got to understand the browser is your platform when you're building single page applications. And they're, they're loaded with preservatives, meaning there's just, there's just a lot of stuff that makes them stick around even after you're kind of done with them. Uh, you can't really get rid of them. Um, so I'm a big fan of micro.js libraries. If you go to micro, I think it's microjs.org. Um, uh, the guy that does Zepto actually maintains that. It's a list of uh, just hundreds and hundreds of small libraries. And they're all small. In fact, the requirement to be on there is gzip, you have to be under five kilobytes. And I'm finding that there's a whole lot of stuff that I can go out there and grab. So for example, last summer, I was supposed to, I had to work with, Ang uh, with uh, Angular and uh, the binding syntax. I actually kind of like their binding syntax. Um, but I found another library called Rivets. It's 3.6 kilobytes compared to 120 kilobytes of Angular. And all it did was just the, the binding for me. And it was, it was great. Um, they have a single focus. They don't try to do everything for everybody. They're not the kitchen sink solution. So you probably, like I said, you only need like 5 or 10% of most of these frameworks. Go find the libraries to solve the needs that you have. And uh, they're going to promote a more modular architecture. So you can plug and swap these things out. And as I think overall your applications are stronger because of that. And as developers, it keeps you kind of involved with it. So with single page applications, there's some, there's some principles that I, that I like to say this is, this is a good way to get these things implemented. First, you have to make them performant, right? You, you want to make it a good experience. And that's the big advantage single page apps have over legacy applications is they're fast. And the thing that really attracted me once I kind of got into the groove and we're, uh, was I can build something that feels like a native application. And you know, that's the biggest compliment I get from real users is when they use my applications, they go, this is better than the native applications I work with. I see, I get that a lot. And it's kind of one of those things that really kind of proves out that I did this right, okay? And I, I keep stressing the modularity point of view. I want things to be modular. I want it to have a small footprint. In fact, um, I haven't even gzipped the code uh, that's used for this application. I want to kind of walk through, walk through today, but I think it was like 56 kilobytes minimized uh, for the whole application. And I can give you another example. Um, I worked with a startup uh, here in the Bay Area last year, and uh, we launched, uh, I think it had 75 views in it, and we launched with 120 kilobytes of JavaScript in it, the whole application. Um, so it's got a nice small footprint. And scalability, and scalability means a lot of different things. Not only do you want your servers to be able to scale out, and you want thousands and thousands and thousands of users to use it simultaneously, but you also want those thousands and thousands of users not to, hit, to create trouble tickets all the time or help desk calls and things like that. So you want to make sure that, that you've got you know, your ducks in a row and that, that it truly does scale so that you, you can get your most bang for the buck. And of course, you want it to be maintainable. And this is, again, I'm going to stress the modular thing. Uh, plus, your developers, if you if you get out of the frameworks, I think your developers will understand JavaScript and the platform better, and they'll be able to understand and maintain your application. But one of the other big things, especially from a business perspective, is you want to have that application last for a long time. And so not only do I want somebody to be able to use it all week long, but I want them to be able to use it for a couple of years and only make minor tweaks if I have to along the way. And that, that implies a lot of stuff. And this is one of the reasons why I love responsive design because it gives me the ability to go ahead and design an experience that's going to work on a lot of different platforms and a lot of different uh, uh, viewport sizes and things like that and still allow the user to be productive. And if I can do that, I don't necessarily know what devices they're going to use a year or two years out, 
for example, the biggest rage right now is, is wearables, right? So I've got a band, and of course a lot of people are ordered the iWatch and stuff like that. If you don't think a browser is not going to be on these things in the near future, you're, you're probably wrong. At the same time, we've, I've seen big giant kiosks and monitors and stuff like 80, 90, 100 inch kind of TVs being used. All kinds of variability out there as far as how somebody can interact with it. Um, so you've got to kind of think ahead of time for what can people do. And, uh, you know, touch has been a big deal over the last few years, but I think you're going to start seeing, say, concepts like Connect kind of start coming into play. And somewhere down the line, I'm sure some things like HoloLens and stuff like that are also going to have an impact. So start thinking about how can we make this thing adaptable um, to, to take advantage of that. Now, if we look at the modern web application, I like to look at it and think about it as an hourglass now, where in the past it was more of a cylinder. Um, you typically, you got a lot of stuff going on at the bottom or the back end of the application, and that's where your business logic, your databases, services, and things like that are, are really humming along. And then in the very middle, you've got a web server layer. And, you know, in the .NET stack, that's going to be ASP.NET and IIS. The other stacks would be ExpressNode, PHP, and Apache, whatever you want there. Where in the past, that would be really broad there, and there would be a lot of responsibility at that layer. Now today, that's really more of an API layer, and if you do a single page application right, you should only have one or two endpoints that return markup. So this, this little layer has gotten really thin, but a lot of those responsibilities have been pinched up into the browser, so that's why we get this little hourglass kind of look. In the middle, you've got like a little aperture there where they kind of communicate back and forth, and that's really the API going back and forth. Another thing that you really got to understand about a website or, or, or a spa is that every time someone visits a page or your site, it's a, it's a loading uh, process. They have to install your application. Think about it in these terms. They have to install your application, which means they have to download it, and then they have to boot it, right? So you're talking about, talking about the JavaScript evaluation stuff. You got to think about it, the fact that they're downloading your code, and then they have to launch it. So no different than a native application where you sit there and wait for the, app, for the full application to get downloaded from the App Store, and then you launch it. By that time, you, you're probably about 45 seconds to a minute into the, the application engagement at that point. If you can make a web application fully load and boot enough, at least, so that the user uh, uh, can be fully engaged within that one second goal, which is always my goal, is try to get it into that one second threshold so that they mentally are there, um, you've far out, you far outpaced your native competition at that point. Um, next thing you need to do is the, the initial request. You, you've got to understand the critical rendering path. Um, and I'm sure we're, people here are going to talk about the critical rendering path a lot over the week. But this is a big part of understanding how to architect your application, is, is knowing that the, how the browsers actually process the markup and the CSS and the JavaScript and the fonts and, and the images and how all that stuff comes together. And so you need to kind of understand how to architect your application to take advantage of that for the initial load so you get that initial uh, experience that you're looking for. And so I always look at, well, how can I define a, a master layout of my page? Because a spa works differently than a regular web app because you're not really rendering the stuff on the server because if I've deep link, let's say I passed around a deep link. Like, let's just take my blog, for example. So I send you a link to a post that I wrote four or five months ago or whatever. My blog is going to know how to instantly hydrate that, but I'm not going to hydrate the markup and stuff on the server at all. And this is kind of a debate that I get in with some folks about how spas work and, and which is faster, server-side rendering or client-side rendering. Well, the, the, the server has no clue what page you're needing to get rendered because that's really going to be masked behind the, uh, the hash fragment, the hash there. So that never gets sent to the server. So it doesn't know what it's actually rendering. So you need to kind of understand what the master layout's going to be. And then another trick that I'm, I'm getting into is, is inlining the critical CSS. This is kind of something I'm, I'm kind of new getting into, a little, I think a little late, later than I should be. But get enough CSS in there so that that master layout can get rendered almost instantly. And then look for the, look for the above the fold views. What are, the, what are the first possible views that a person will probably go to? And get that CSS isolated out as well. And then Find your core JavaScript and, and stuff like that and make sure that that's initially available so your application can start running. And make that as small a footprint as possible. So in that case of that 400 view application, going back and re-architecting that today, I'd probably start off with like four or five views and the rest of it I would defer or lazy load. And I'll show you kind of how that works. 
And that's what I'm talking about here. The deferred request is like the balance of your application. And um, most applications are usually pretty small and you don't necessarily need to be at this level. But 400 views, you definitely need to be. The 75 view application, we didn't do this. And I really felt bad about it because we just didn't have enough time to get, get this architected. But um, something with 75 views, you probably should have offloaded this stuff. And uh, there's some parts that you need to understand that the SPA needs to run that the server is used to running, and that's managing routing. So you need to have a little routing engine involved. And a little trick that I've learned that goes against the grain too is um, to actually make the routes uh, part of my markup and have my SPA engine parse those out rather than defining that in some sort of JavaScript driven uh, routing table. I found that to be a lot more brittle in the long run. Leverage browser caching. So Patrick was talking about how service workers allow you to cache uh, content quite a bit. And I, like I said, I use local storage a lot. And I use it for some things that some people haven't quite, I don't know if they've necessarily gotten to the mainstream or not, but I certainly do it. And you've got to maintain and manage your data a little differently than you normally would have too. And uh, finally, the, the, the client side is responsible for the rendering, whereas in the traditional websites, it's done on the server. And if you look at this, like a side view of my applications, this is generally what it is. I have a SPA library, and then I have a view engine that's responsible for that rendering and also parsing of the views and, and templates and stuff. And then I'll have a template engine. That template engine can, like I'm going to show you today, is really a 21 line function. But you could replace that. I've done a lot with mustache. And I did handlebars for a while, and then I realized I wasn't using 90% of handlebars, so I went back to mustache. Or, or like I said, rivets. I've got a, another alternate version where we've used rivets which is a, a bonding or a MVVM model approach. And over on the side, I always have an application object. It doesn't do a whole lot, but it's really more or less to kind of namespace out the controllers and the controllers map to individual views. If you're familiar with MVC, I kind of follow that pattern. And then uh, I'll have like a data stack, and the data uh, does all my AJAX stuff, but it's also got a caching component to it, so that it goes through the cache to see if it's there before you go down into the AJAX and make the call. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty simple. Anything beyond that is really like a, I call a UI component. So with markup management, like I said, I want to keep the DOM lean. I want to leverage browser storage and persist the markup. And I persist it in uh, local storage. And um, it was actually one Saturday back in, I think, 2011. Um, I was trying to figure out how to deal with application cache. And this led me to the solution. I believe it or not, I found it on Steve's blog. He was pointing out that, that Google and Bing both offload their markup and store it in local storage. And I thought that was brilliant. And I sat down and wrote a prototype that afternoon. And uh, that blog post is kind of the, produ the product of that, that afternoon. So and I've, I've really matured and, and pushed that along. And it's, it's served me very well over the years. Um, so this view engine, uh, basically, like I said, it parses the markup for views and templates. And it stores all that into storage for me. And then I just retrieve the markup on demand instead of uh, essentially going back to the server to get, get it out of uh, local storage. And, of and it also has uh, the functionality that abstracts the templating or binding. I put it into a common interface. That way I can replace my 20 line function with, say, rivets or mustache or whatever I want. Because there's, there's dozens and dozens of templating libraries out there. So whatever you, you want to use, feel free to do it. Um, like I said, the lazy load, I'm, I'm getting to the point consistently where I can be well under 14 kilobytes. And the reason why that's important uh, I believe Ilya is going to speak here later this week, but he published a lot of research around this. The way HTTP works, the first packet is 14 kilobytes of actual data, and you want to eliminate the round trips to and from the server. So if you can get enough into that first 14 kilobytes to get that initial uh, rendering, um, that's going to be almost instantaneous to the user. Um, the view engine, like I said, it still parses the markup and caches everything. And I also set it up so on the deferred stuff, it'll actually uh, uh, store references for my CF CSS and script now too and inject that in there so that it gets a little faster um, and I'm getting better and better uh, with this so it's kind of a process so who's heard of cutting the mustard yet okay so this is something that uh, is attributed to the BBC I first heard of it I think when Andy Hume was talking about how the Guardian implemented it at a smashing conference but basically what you do is you do some feature detection in the uh, the client and then uh, if they don't cut the mustard or else the browser doesn't support some key features you want, um, then effectively you reroute them back to the server and you, you give them that legacy website experience. And 
uh, you, uh, the way I kind of look at it too at the same time, um, oh yeah, don't use polyfills. So when you're, when you're looking for features, uh, one of the rules I have is to not use polyfills. So if something's not really broadly supported, I don't try to leverage it yet uh, until I feel comfortable with it. But um, this whole cutting the mustard thing and going back and getting it from the server, it helps with SEO because Google actually has a spec out there for Ajax applications to be indexed. Now, the kind of the, the buzz here lately in the SEO world is that uh, the Google bots can parse and, and do your, your SPA applications now and that that doesn't seem to be a limitation anymore. But they've had this spec out there for a few years and I've been implementing my sites that are public to leverage this and it seems to be doing fine. They still have a lot of SEO, link juice and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm getting good placement in the search engines. So until I truly trust that the search engines are, are parsing through it, I'm still going to implement this. So it kind of serves a dual purpose if you've got to support legacy browsers and search engines. And there's the link to it. Okay. Um, like I said, determine the pub the poll. Usually my rule is five to ten views. Uh, whatever can be accessible within one click of the, the first page is usually what I'm going to look at or mentally what they might want to go to. For example, I've got a link to the privacy policy on my main navigation. I seriously doubt anybody's going to go read that, so it's not in my initial load. So what this really looks like is you, you determine like the, the initial views or pages that somebody can get to, and then you kind of lazy load the rest of it, and they kind of get added into the application, and it just naturally flows from there. All right, so the data management. This is kind of one of the big things that, um, that you should be doing with any AJAX stuff. Now, I'm just going gonna, gonna to let you read these, but um, some story that I read about, a, about two years ago, and I, for the life of me, can't, don't have a reference to it anymore. Um, they had analyzed native applications, and they had determined that the ones that they analyzed, 96% of the requests to the APIs were for uh, data that they had already gotten and had not changed. So if they had just cached the data locally, their application would have run a whole lot faster, and their bandwidth costs would have been a lot less, and their servers could scale more. So make sure you've got something in place to cache the data somewhere in the browser. Um, I leveraged something I got from Paul Irish. Uh, he created an a, a Ajax pre-filter to, to store uh, data in local storage. And so I leveraged that concept and still use that, that main thing today. So if you look at local storage in my browser, it looks like this. I've got all kinds of pieces for my site. And over on the right, I've got JSON data that has a lot of configuration information, a lot of data that was retrieved so that I don't go back to the server and get something that hasn't gone stale effectively. And if, I, if you actually look down, there's actually time to live values associated with each one of those references in storage. And if you look at the actual flow chart to it, this is what it looks like. I look at the data requested. Is it in cache? If it's not in cache or it's gone stale, then I go back through and make the regular AJAX request. And when it comes back, I, I cache that data with the appropriate time to live value. If, if it is in cache, let's go ahead and return it. So uh, the timing on that is usually about 5 to 10, maybe 15 milliseconds compared to making a full AJAX request to the server. Um, it's a lot of benefit all around at that point. Um, responsive images. If you remember back to the stats from HD Barkov, right now about 1.3 megs per page is nothing but images. And we're, we're getting to the point now where we're getting responsive images implemented in most of the browsers. And the way it's implemented in a way so there's a natural a fall, fallback for progressive enhancement kind of thing. So you can, you can start kind of leveraging this. I haven't gone about doing this yet, and this is one of my tasks for the next month or so, is to start implementing responsive images. But one of the things I like to do, if I can control the data, I want to have links or references to at least four or five different image sizes. And the sizes are, you know, you can also do art direction in that as well. And the, the reason is because, I, I, like I said, I don't necessarily know what they're going to be viewing the content on. So I want to try to give them the best experience I possibly can. So you want to do responsive images and, and try to have multiple sizes available to you. And this is a big deal because most uh, even marketing departments and stuff like that have not grasped this concept yet. So we've got to figure out some ways to maybe automate this as much as possible and, and make this as easy as I can. Um, so uh, there's some tools I've been looking at, and, and you can go out there and kind of look with me. And pay attention to my blog because I'll probably be writing more about this over the summer. Another thing to kind of replace images in a lot of ways are fonts. You can also uh, do sprites and SVGs and stuff like that. I've started to get more into the glyph fonts, like Font Awesome and stuff like that. But again, those font files can be rather large. So one of the things I like to do is go to something like Fontello, 
where I, it, Fontella is really nice because it's got like five or six different standard uh, glyph fonts that a lot of people use. And you can just go through and you can just select the icons that you want to use and it'll create a custom font for you. And that's actually what I did for this little furniture site that I did. And um, so now you've got a little small font file instead of a, re a, more, a larger font file. And then of course you want to implement and exercise your common web performance optimization techniques and best practices. Um, most of these I still do not see being implemented uh, when I go analyze sites and go or brought into customers and do analysis and reports for them. Uh, very rarely do I see bundling and minification, which I think is, should be like just the, the first thing you do when you go to production. For life, I don't know why. I don't know why CSS is scattered throughout the page at all points. And I don't know why scripts are constantly in the head and lots of them. Um, and I see lots of inline scripts as well, which is really bad. Um, as well as putting scripts at the bottom, go ahead and add that async tag. Um, I haven't really found much benefit from it in my architecture, and it's maybe because of the way I architect it. It's not necessarily as prominent, but if I, but if I use it with customers, it does make a difference. Um, use a CDN. Back when Steve wrote his book, CDNs were super expensive, and I could not afford it. So the best that I could do was create a subdomain on my web server and put my images or something like, you know, like that out there. But today we've got Amazon, we've got Azure, you know, and Right now, my, my uh, S3 cost for the last five years has averaged about six cents a month with the CDN thrown on top of it. And I'm starting to use Azure and their CDN, and it's probably even a little bit less, to be honest with you. Um, so go out there and use the CDN. Even if it's just, like I said, the poor man's CDNs of, of Amazon and Azure, um, but that's another thing, too. I'm not necessarily seeing leverage very well. And there, there's going to be a lot of CDN companies here, so there's a lot of competition in this space. Another thing is optimize images. I have not done this for this application yet because I've been kind of playing with the image sizes and stuff, trying to figure out where I want to be at. And i be honest with you, I have over 5,500 images, so it's been a little slower process than I would have wanted uh, for these images. But I, I am starting to go through and actually optimize them, and that means you know, com essentially compressing the bits, the bits that are in there. Um, this is a common problem that, that I see across the web, so that 1.3 megabytes can radically be reduced in most cases. Um, so I was working for a big uh, Fortune, I don't know, 100-ish company last uh, fall, and uh, they asked me for some quick hits that they could do to, to make web performance optimization on their site. And their site gets, you know, several million page views an hour. So um, I gave them a lot of reference, you know, things to point to. And one of the things I pointed out was that their images, I could easily optimize the images by at least 25% on average, if not more. And I, and I said, nothing else. Look at your CDN hosting cost and just cut that by 25%. And they like that. You know, at that, that scale, that's a lot of money right there. So that's exactly what they did. They actually went out and automated a tool and started optimizing their images, and their bandwidth cost went down dramatically. Uh, dramat dramatically. I went around long enough to see if the customer uh, response was good or not, but I'm pretty sure it, it was subtly there. Um, and also, HTTP caching. If you notice the stats there, less than half the web uses HTTP caching. That's another bad thing um, we need to do. Um, and of course, shard your assets. I don't shard them too much. And I think HTTP2 is going to change some of that for us as well. So there's uh, some things around that. So these are kind of the best practices. What I'm going to do is let's, let's flip over and actually look at the application. So I've gone from nothing to this application uh, really over the last three weeks of my spare time. So there's, like I said, there's probably going to be some demons we're going to come across. So this is, this is the application in Chrome. Um, this is actually hosted up, I got it up on my virtual machine. So it's fastfurniture.lovetodev.com. And you're the first people to see it outside of myself and my wife who probably hadn't even paid attention to me doing this. <laughs> but So you're the first people to really see this outside of, of my own workspace for the last few, few months. And I'll tell you what I did. Like I said, uh, Rotten Tomatoes deprecated their API, and so my application really wasn't going to work any well, very well. And I had a customer about 10 years ago, and they were a furniture store, and they were probably the worst customer I ever had. But uh, anyway, they, when, they, when they went out of business, you know, I still had all their assets and stuff like that. They had over 5,500 images of furniture, and most of them were really good, high-quality images to a certain degree. So I said, hey, I still got those images. Let me just go generate a fake store with all this stuff. So that's, that's effectively what I've been doing. I spent half my time creating fake data based on these images. So um, if you go look at the repo, there are, there are lots of files there. The images are not part of the repo. They're actually hosted up on Azure. 
But I did, instead of like tying this to a particular backend data store or creating a, a true backend API, all I'm doing is I'm storing JSON files as part of the repo and I'm, I'm just serving those, those JSON files up. So um, it's not a true full backend kind of scenario, but uh, it is one of the things that I've, that I've found to be very beneficial with modern web applications is having some sort of denormalized NoSQL kind of data store right behind the web because those tend to work really fast serving up data and let those lay those kind of long running back end processes kind of work through something like a service bus kind of message queue kind of scenario um, for you and, and let your, your front end data be optimized for the front end. I've seen a lot of benefits by doing that. So anyway, um, this is a kind of a real simple site at this point. I've got some responsive stuff in it, but for the most part they're, they're gonna be there. But um, it, it's kind of your traditional site. Now, I really have always been a fan of Metro, or what Microsoft calls Metro Modern UI. I really like that. And a lot of those applications have that horizontal scrolling. So I've got that in place here too. And I've kind of got them in groups. So it's kind of like a Metro application, which I'm fond of. But one of the reasons why I did it this way is because this homepage has a lot of images in it. And so it's very image intensive. And so it gives me a good idea of, of bottlenecks and stuff with images. And like right now, I don't have these images optimized, so my, my waterfalls don't look as good as I want them to be right now. But you know, if we can go here, this is the living room category. And so you're kind of seeing kind of how fast this goes. What would I do there? Yeah. But now I've broken it. Arr, the demons. Here you are trying to talk about a fast site and it, and it suddenly slows down as you mentioned how fast it is. Let's just reload it. Yeah, it's probably the bandwidth in here, right? This is what happened a while ago. I was sitting there, I was going fine, and it just went to crawl. And it looks like that may be what's going on. Alrighty. Let's go, let's go to a different browser. The reason why I went over there is because I, I just figured out how to get the, uh, the cross origin stuff set up on the fonts. Um, you'll notice these aren't exactly the fonts, the glyph fonts that I had before, but uh, we'll just see what happens here. Huh. Yeah, that's really slow. There we go. It's kind of interesting that, that, it, that it waited to render the rest of the stuff to let the image popped in. I wonder why it did that. Because it is a markup and stuff there. All right. What I'm going to do. Let's just kind of do the, the nickel tour of the behind the scenes here, if it'll let me. There we go. All right, what I want to do, let's get this out of the way. This is always harder to do when they scrunch your, your screen down too, so hopefully we'll be okay. What I'm going to do is... Let's minimize this. There we go. I don't like that flashing. There we go. This is not the way it worked before. All right. All right, so let's do this. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the home. Maybe. There we go. And if you were able to, if you were able to see it, it went kind of fast there. If you look inside this main content, this is what I use kind of as my main hook, where all my views are going to be. And so I've got things set up. I actually have a, a child layout concept that, that I can employ here, and that's kind of what I've got here. You see this spa layout, and I've got the show. Uh, class involved, and then inside of that is what it's called a spa child view. That's the actual content of the page there. And if I go back, let's just go back and hit one of these. If you saw it really quick, another, the second child view was injected in there, and it was animated in, so it was kind of slid in with CSS animations. And when that animation was over, the previous view was removed from the DOM. And this is part of keeping the DOM clean. Um, so I had to put a lot of work into this back in the, back in the day to kind of add and remove things. Now, if we go down here, you'll notice I don't have that much content in here. But if you actually looked at the initial request for the markup, 
there was additional script tags, but I marked those as uh, with a, a special type on there that indicated they were, they were views from my SPA application or templates from my SPA application. And those also get removed. And I think if we go up here to the network tab, you can see them. Uh, no. Yeah. Oh. Well, they should be there. Anyway. So they, they would be in the initial request. Let me see if I can get this cleared out and start it over again. Yeah, here they are. So see, here's all the, like the script tags I was talking about. So the, when the application loads, part of the booting process, if you will, is the SPA uh, library and the view engine going through, finding these, these sections and putting those into storage. And another trick when I, when I ultimately when I, before I launch, I could get to a point where um, the server side actually cooperates with the, the client side, and I look at the if modified since header. And what it does is it actually checks to see if the file on the server has changed since the, the last time that the, the client requested this particular page. And it only injects in the ones, the pieces that have changed, effectively the views that have actually changed. So there could be a very small amount of markup that gets sent back down to the client, where in the, at the beginning it could be a large amount. And so they can give you another advantage in the payload stuff, especially if you're trying to get in that 14 kilobyte uh, payload goal. And let's go, I'm gonna go over to Chrome's tools because they have better resources here. So I mentioned the local storage piece and let me sit down so I won't be yelling so much. So you see I, I store a lot of the stuff here. So I've got a JSON object and if you look at this carefully, you can see it's got the markup here. So when it goes through and parses the, uh, the markup, it, it puts it in here and it also creates uh, a JSON object for each of the views. And if you, we go back and we look, really, you can do that to me now. If you go back here and look at this, you can see I've got some, some attributes that are important here. Um, I actually use the ID on each one of these views to map it to a controller, and this indicates that what kind of uh, view it is. I'm, so I'm looking for this spa view class, and how the animation's supposed to work for it, um, the ID, if it's got a parent layout, what that's gonna be, and then here's the route I was talking about. So I actually put the routes here as part of the, the, the definition of the actual view, and that keeps a kind of direct relationship to that particular vo uh, uh, view. And then to get around the script tag not part processing this, I always set the type to something besides script. In this case, I just say it's a spa view. You don't have to do anything terribly fancy. Uh, a lot of times you'll see like X something, which is what I do with my templates. If we go down far enough, we'll see a template. There's one. This one's got text and then X simple template kind of thing going on here. And that keeps the browser from, from processing this as a, as a regular script. And you can look at this as a more complex route. I've actually got it set up so you can do parameters as well. So if you put a, a, a colon in front of that password there, that would make the password into a parameter and that name would get passed in with the actual value um, to the controller ultimately. And uh, that way you can kind of branch off and do different stuff. All right. All right. So, all right. So I showed you kind of how the view swapping works. And um, so another thing that I'm getting into a little more that I've kind of come back around to is this, the lazy loading stuff. So I've got another call here. And this one's to uh, my deferred content, or effectively stuff that's not being loaded up front. And the first thing I'm doing is telling you what CSS files to go grab and inject those into the DOM. And so it kind of does this for me kind of dynamically. So it's a, a way to lazy load CSS and JavaScript. And we're, You've seen a lot of people starting to write CSS loaders and things like that. It kind of leverages those concepts. And then here's the secondary views. They're gonna go through that same processing. And then down at the bottom, we'll have something for the scripts as well. 
and uh, same thing. So this is production, so I've got bundled minified files now for development. I don't bundle and minify them. I like to keep them individual because it makes it easier for me to kind of have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship to them, I believe. One of these. No, they're both, okay. Ah, this is the local host, good. So if we go look at this waterfall, you can see it's a, it's a lot bigger. So I have a lot of individual files, um, and it helps me as a developer maintain and manage where, where I need to debug effectively. So you can see there's a lot of requests here. But if you go back and look at the, the request for the production version, there's not near as many requests. This one's gonna have a lot of image requests because it's gonna be the home page right there, so. Um, all right. All right, so. There we go. Let me kind of walk you through a little bit of the, the code here too. Get off All right, so this is this is my like data clash right here, and like I said, I've got some basic stuff to implement the the job the the AJAX calls here. Like I said, it doesn't take a whole lot of code to do AJAX. And I think a lot of people think it's very complicated, but you can get into some abstractions and stuff like that. Um, one of the things I've kind of found is that. Pretty much the modern browsers are really good at implementing core API stuff pretty consistently. And so we don't need a lot of the, the kind of hacks and stuff we've had to employ in the past to, uh, to get around some stuff. And if you do the, the cutting the mustard thing, you kind of can have a reasonable uh, expectation that, that you don't need to implement a whole lot of uh, cross-browser kind of things to, to fix issues. So I've got some basic functions here that just kind of abstract, you know, common uh, HTTP verbs for AJAX and stuff like that. And here I'm getting a little lazy. I just got one big file with a bunch of calls in here. I'll probably eventually refactor these out, but if we want to, let's see, let's just say get category or whatever. Notice I'm making a call here to this get cached object function. And what that's gonna do is, is go through that pipeline and it's gonna first check to see if the data is in local storage or not. And if it is, it's gonna just return that, otherwise, it's gonna go through the AJAX pipeline. So you can see here, if I have this cache data, I'm gonna go ahead and make the callback. Now, another thing to notice here, I have not implemented promises. And the reason why I didn't implement promises is I didn't wanna to have to use a polyfill, because most of the promise polyfills, I think, are, are kinda of large right now. And we're right on the cusp where the browsers are gonna cross the board implement promises for us natively. And, you know, a lot of people are worried about callback hell and the pyramid of doom and stuff like that. I've never truly felt like I fell into that, so I'm not terribly afraid of using callbacks. And it uh, makes this process a little easier, too. But once the, once the promises are kind of natively supported across the board, um, I'll quickly kind of swap this out uh, for a promise uh, architecture. But for now, I'll just make the callback, um, the, the success callback, and pass the, uh, the data that was stored. And then whatever called, it's gonna process it as it needs to. Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and call that get data to make the AJAX call. And it's, it's pretty much that simple. Um, I've got a caching object and I've got a few functions that manage the, uh, the caching layer. And the reason why I've got it into a caching object is so I can leverage it here in AJAX as well as uh, say for the views and templates and stuff like that. Or any other place that I wanna leverage uh, uh, local storage caching and have a time to live associated with it. So it gives me the ability to kind of allow my data to be stale and purge it out as I need to. Are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Yes. So the question is, how do I get around limitations of browser storage? Uh, and this is a question I get asked a lot, um, because five megabytes is what you get for local storage. I've never run into a problem with the quota on local storage at this point, and that sounds crazy, but you can pack a lot of markup in local storage. Um, even with 400 views, you're still only looking at a few hundred kilobytes at most of markup. Um, the data 
that will drive an application generally is not going to be that intensive if you really look at it. So I think like Patrick was uh, mentioned in his talk, um, to do the waterfall thing, I forget how many megabytes the actual image uh, consumed, but the data to generate that graph was only 20 kilobytes. So if you're, if you're looking at like JSON data, it's usually pretty small in format, and that's, that's the nice thing about it. So if you just stringify that JSON and store it, it doesn't take up a lot of space. So for example, that, that 75 page view that, we, that I did this past uh, winter, um, 75 pages, I think we may have had 150 kilobytes at any given point in local storage. We had a lot of room left to go. And we were running that application, running it through different user scenarios and stuff like that. A lot of data goes a long way, and just because it's big and rendered for the screen doesn't necessarily mean it's a whole lot of data behind the scenes. Um, another, another question that I get from time to time from uh, customers and things like that is, well, what happens if we need 5,000 records in a table or something like that? You should never have 5,000 records in a table, I'm sorry. Manage it different ways. There's different ways to deal with that scenario. Um, that's kind of the exception to the rule, uh, having something that large. But even, unless you've got a really wide record set, um, the 5,000 records still doesn't necessarily mean it's going to take up a lot of data. A common problem there, uh, I'll give you an example. I had a customer that uh, they had, uh, I think, a 100 column wide record, and they were returning like 5,000 of them. Let's just use that for sake. Um, but they only used eight of those columns. So I told them to create a different API that returned a more shaped piece of data to fit what they were actually rendering instead of returning all that data that they never used because they, they very rarely used any of the data. So think about that when you're, you're, you're doing things. And you had another question? Yeah. Um, I've used it very little because I've gotten away with so much in local storage. I just haven't had to go to IndexedDB for anything yet. Um, it's one of those things I, I just want the, the big excuse to go kind of dig into IndexedDB. Um, the service worker concept will probably push me over the top because some of the things Patrick was talking about are things that I'm implementing without service workers. So effectively, some of the, the things I'm showing like with storing the views in local storage, that I effectively have now have a polyfill once service workers are across the board. So yeah, I haven't done a whole lot with IndexedDB yet, but if I did have some scenario that, that needed uh, more space or really more querying capabilities over it, IndexedDB would probably be the direction I would go. Are there any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, his question is, since uh, JavaScript's uh, essentially single-threaded, why do I want to render my content on the client side versus the server side? And um, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've had that question a lot. And I actually um, had a little debate with one of the IE engineers a couple of weeks ago. So I actually peeled off a little bit of time and played with this application at one point. And I, rend I did something where I was rendering the markup via the API on the server, or I and I would compare that to what it took to actually render it on the client. And I used like the timing API and stuff to see what the differences were. And honestly, there was no difference, believe it or not. Um, and you gotta realize, I'm not using like a, an expensive templating engine. I've got 20 line function that's doing my templating for me. So when I compared the, the server side markup being sent up to the client side markup and, and essentially doing the same exact thing, setting it to enter HTML, the timings, I mean, I did like 100 runs of each one. It was roughly about the same on either one of them. So, and it also depended on how much markup. It was kind of interesting watching that. So like the home page had a lot more markup than say the product detail page. The home page was rendering in 40 milliseconds on average, and the product detail was like eight milliseconds on average. Um, so when you're looking at those kind of things, it, it's, um, it, it doesn't really wash out, especially since the server doesn't necessarily know what's getting rendered. So I had to, I had to essentially, I had to add a different formatter to my API to, so instead of like you, by default, most of them are JSON and XML, I added one to do HTML as well. Uh, it's more or less what I did. It was a cheap way to do it, but it did it. So uh, yeah, the rendering itself was ident almost identical. And I think if you went to some of the more expensive libraries, it's probably gonna be show you some differences there. 
Um, so the more steps you do, the more processing, I think it's going to make a difference. So are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, let me. I, I, oh, heck no. No. Oh, let's go look at that. That's one of the things I wanted to get to. Uh, here we go. So here's the entire script to cut the mustard on the client. Literally all I do is check to see if there's certain uh, APIs that are supported. Now for mine, I use query selector because that essentially eliminates like IE7, I think, maybe IE8. Local storage, which by the way, IE8 supports local storage and IE8 should, let's just say it's going to purge itself on January 16th when Microsoft stops supporting it. Um, let's hope. Um, and of course, Ad Event Listener would eventually get rid of IE8. Now, the match media is a big one. I use that for especially responsive images. Uh, and I say to add a little responsive pixie dust to my applications so that I can, through the JavaScript, use breakpoints in the JavaScript to drive slightly different experiences based on the, the viewport that I've got available to me. Now, match media is supported in the IE10 timeframe and up in all the browsers. And it's kind of a neat little trick that most developers are not even aware of. And I'll show you how I implemented this uh, here in a second. But what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see, in these last things, I'm checking to see are you um, in a browser that didn't support uh, these, these functions? And if so, I'm going to route you back to the server using the escape fragment uh, query string parameter, which follows the Google, AP, the Google specification. Now, if someone sent you a link from, say, a legacy browser that had that query string parameter, by, in, inversely, I'm going to redirect you back to the high fidelity because your browser is cool and supports all this stuff and I'm going to let you have the better experience. So that's effectively what's going on with this script right here. And that's all there is to it. It's not very big at all. And I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of having inline scripts, but this is one of the times that I'll get it away. Plus it's the very first thing that I'm doing in the top of the DOM. There's all kinds of little tricks to structuring your markup to make sure you don't re-trigger the critical rendering path to recycle, right? So you want to get around that. So for example, uh, you can put some directives in HTTP headers instead of in meta tags up here. Go ahead and do that because those get evaluated before it even gets to the markup and allows the browser to process things quicker. All right, so let me just go look at this home or the match media stuff real quick because I found this to be invaluable in particular for um, uh, responsive images at this point. Although hopefully this is going to be something I can get away from in the near future. This little technique. But uh, here we go. So who's heard of match media at this point? All right, I'll give you a real quick explanation. Back to what it is, it's a JavaScript API that allows you to set CSS media query breakpoints so that an event triggers and you can determine if the browser meets that criteria or not and then you can uh, uh, react accordingly. So if you see on these, these four lines, I've got one for phone, small tablet, tablet, and desktop defined. And I just call window.matchmedia, and I pass in a, a media query breakpoint definition there. And then down below, I'm adding an event listener. Now, they don't have add event listener on this, it's just add listener, so they, they chop the event, but it's the same exact deal going on here. And in that, it's just a callback function. Now the way I've set this up is I've got, in my main application, I've got um, a callback function placeholder effectively. And on each of my views, if I need to use any of these breakpoints, I just set a callback to it and I clean up after myself when it's destroyed. And so what I'm doing here is it's going to call that function, which if we go back over here to home, you can see I've set that to this set images size function. And of course, that's not going to do what I ask it to do. Oh. I hit the wrong button. Sorry, guys. So here I'm kind of running through. Now, if, if say, picture set or source set was, was fully implemented across browsers, which hopefully by this time next year will, um, I can probably eliminate all this code. But effectively what I'm doing is I'm doing some tricks. It didn't really come across well because of the resizing and stuff for the, the projector. But um, the way I've set up the application is if it's on a phone format, then I'm using a smaller image. 
if it's as you go up, they they change to bigger images, and that first that first product image, say on the home page list, is bigger than the other ones, right? So I'm using different ones. So I've got some logic in here to kind of set the reference to those images so that it pulls up a more appropriate image. So effectively, it's kind of a JavaScripting what you can do with uh, source set and uh, and the picture uh, fills and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So are there any other questions? Now, trying to see beyond the lights to just make sure. All right, well, I'm going to be here all week. And if you've got any more questions, come ask me afterwards. And I uh, appreciate you uh, sharing this time with me and let me talk about some of my favorite topics. We hope you've enjoyed this video. And we'll select the like button below. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. And if you're interested in our newsletter, please visit lovetodev.com newsletter.